Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Restaurant Success Club. Super excited to be here, hope you are as well. Uh, if you don't know, this is a star-studded group today. Uh, I am over the moon, or if that's still a topic, I know that sounds kind of old, but I am over the moon of the people that are here uh, in the group. I'm sure Scott has his own English saying that he says, and we'll get to that later. Um, Today's show, we're going to be talking about disruption, how uh, the industry needs to be disrupted and what that looks like. How do we deal with mindset changes and things like that? So I want to introduce really quickly to the group. Um, first, if you do not follow uh, my, my newsletter, please subscribe to that. Each Monday, I will write something on a topic. And then that following Thursday... We talk about that in more in depth, and then I shut up and I listen to experts in the field that know way more than I do about this particular topic. And so I'm excited to have four guys on the show. This is the biggest show we've had so far. Um, I have Scott Turner back, obviously from Auden Hospitality in London. Um, I have Jay Afton, the rest uh, Canada's restaurant guy up in Canada. And then we have Michael Tips, who is a coast to coast guy. I think he's got a place in LA and out here in Florida. And then Christian is up in the Northeast. Um, you won't be able to tell that from his accent. I have two people with accents. So <laughs> if you don't understand, maybe next time we'll get some subtitles. But super excited to have you guys on the show. Um, and um, really quickly, as a final introduction, um, these gentlemen I've known for a while, I respect them all immensely. Um, this could very well be my favorite show because of who's on today. Um, Scott and I are working on a couple projects together right now that you'll hear more about in the future. Michael Tips and I are working on something that he's put together um, that I'm super excited about. Christian and I are going to start doing a live uh, stream every Monday at 2 o'clock. Um, and then Jay, Jay and I have been on each other's shows more than anybody on the planet, I think. So super <laughs> excited to have you guys. Um, let's go ahead and get to, if you're, if you're watching this, feel free to comment. You can either comment of something that you are interested in adding to the conversation and or asking a question for somebody in the group specifically or just the group in general. So we're going to get started with question one. Um, what does the term disrupt mean to you? And why do you think our industry needs to be disrupted? And I'm going to go ahead and start with Christian. Because, <laughs> because he's got a show. He's called the disruptive show. So it's in your title. So we'll start with you, sir. So it, it, it's simple. It's process o uh, process over perfection. So uh, first off, thanks a lot for having me. And uh, for me, Disruption means two things. Number one, uh, getting the opportunity to look at things differently. Um, there's a really corny saying which goes, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And I honestly believe you need to do more of that. And the second thing for me, disruption means having the opportunity to out-deliver anybody else. And for me, if you look at things differently and you service people like nobody else, you by default become a disruptor. So for me, the two things change the way you look at things because the things you look at change and out deliver everybody else. Excellent. Who wants to follow that? Um, all right, show's over. Uh, <laughs> um, Michael, Michael, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting. I think that I 100% I agree with Christian. I think that, you know, <clears throat> disruption is about making people uncomfortable. And the reason why the business is the way it is, whether it be a hotel or a mom and pop gas station restaurant, is that everybody has this habit of following the crowd at lunchtime. You're, you're, you're in a business that's the Wild West, essentially. So even like that top 5% of the business that operates at the highest level never really meets the other 95%. And everybody just keeps copying each other. So, you know, they're kind of, they typically they copy what was before them, not what's ahead of them, which is the problem, <laughs> right? The fundamental issue. So. Playing off of what Christian said, I, I agree that the perspective has to shift completely, tying into what works and what doesn't work. And that really ties into creating a standard. I think that we, we, work, that. In a business, we work in a business that doesn't really have standards. Like within the business, it does, right? But it's, 
It's one of the oldest industries on the planet, and yet it's the most unregulated. Mm-hmm. It's truly unregulated. Like someone says, this is how you do it. It's because that's how they learned it, and they will they will die on that hill. But it's not because that's a standard way that you learn architecture, as an example. You know, mm-hmm. you learn about mm-hmm. bearing walls. There's a standard <laughs> that keeps people alive. There's a way to fly an aircraft. That's a standard. But when it comes to opening a restaurant, bar, or hotel, it's pretty much, well, who do you know? And whatever they say. So I think part of the, the bigger goal of being a disruptor is creating standards that work for people and not making it one way, but having people commit to goals, not ideals. Uh, I know that's a little broad, but ideals are like the, sun, the sunrise. They just keep going or the horizon. They keep going farther and farther away. And like you said, you know, progress, not perfection. So, uh, yeah, and challenge in the model and remembering that you're in the business of serving others, not of being cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, I totally, Michael, I absolutely love that. And I, I think more people need to think of standards the way you just laid it out, because I honestly believe our industry or, or individual restaurants, they rise or fall, not yeah. just around leadership. They also re- rise and fall around their standards they have for themselves, for their their employees and from their client. Mm-hmm. And I totally, I, I want to add, by the way, this super insight for Michael, for me, I overlay one. I think we need to become a little bit more selective of our non-negotiables. And because if I overlay my non-negotiables, standards are easy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 well said. Cool. Uh, Jerry, what do you think? Wow. Um, I have a similar saying where I, I believe that imperfection is perfection today. And uh, I've said that a few times and it's just by no means am I perfect. Uh, and I never will be. Um, as Montese, as, as you may know from my shows I've done, I, I, you know, I, being a disruptor, I, I think it's one, I think it's a fancy name of, uh, that we use today. And I am, I believe it's about innovation and creativity and I come from a creative background. I have an art degree and somehow I got into this industry during that time period um, of being in the arts. And I really look at how do, how do we challenge the status quo? How do we challenge things? How do we look at things through a different lens? And I really think the more that we can inspire others to do that, because being a disruptor, not everyone's a disruptor, not everyone's be creative. And sometimes we we anticipate or we think a lot of restaurateurs or chefs and stuff like that are creative. And I've run into this a lot of the times where I almost have it as an Achilles to me is, is being so creative sometimes is that um, I get labeled that way a lot. And I get a, a labeled, oh, the creative guy or the guy that's always in, uh, doing things differently or you do things different. And it is sometimes really great, and I'm proud of that, but I believe sometimes being a disruptor is also challenging. It has its challenges. Uh, It's not easy. It's not easy being the guy green in the corner. It's not easy doing that. But I think today, I think being a disruptor, especially in today's market, um, every house in a new division, subdivision today look the same. They're painted the same. You know, they, they almost are identical. Sometimes you pull up in the wrong house. And I think that we need to, we need to embrace people that are different. And I've been too much pushed out of so many different associations and things like that from being different that um, it's tough some days, but I believe it's, it's really around being creative, innovative and looking at things completely different. Um, and that's, that goes way back when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> going way back as a kid is looking at things differently, you know, staring at the roof and pretending that's the floor for hours at a time. You know, those kind of things is, is how I, I, I see the world. Um, but be, and, and I think that's where I enjoy being a disruptor in my space in the Canadian market. Um, yeah. I don't know if that makes any cool. sense. Hey Jay, uh, for the next round, you're, your mic is going in and out. You may want to check is that. It? Yeah. Damn, um, nice. Scott, Scott, well, my, well, Jay's working on that. What do you got, Scott? Um, yeah, I want to, I want to build on something that Michael said before I answer, just because I, I, a hundred percent agree with him on the process thing is great example. I always give people in, in this scenario is why did Southwest airlines go viral on social media? Because they put into process, and they didn't do their announcements on, from the cabin crew 
the way every other airline does it. They do it a little bit differently, inject personality. And it's just a great example of what Michael was saying there about how you can take process and you can put something on it. You can be individual, you can create something unique. I think what's disrupted to me, disrupt, I think, you know, th there's been some great examples. The guys have touched on it a lot, but for me, they're in it. The people who are willing to be uncomfortable, the people who are willing to be put their confidence on the line and, and put it out there, the people who are take risks and the people who are willing to go out of the comfort zone to try and push boundaries. And I think when, whenever I look at brands that we would say are truck brands, they're the people who just look at things differently and create different reasons for people to go and visit what they're doing. So I think uh, it's, you know, there's to build on things that everyone else has taken. I think um, mm -hmm. it's people who are willing to be uncomfortable. Yeah, great. Hey, Monty, great. I, just, I wanted to add something really quickly to, to what Scott yep. said. Or really what everybody said. I think the one thing that, that and also with Jay, you know, saying that I, I relate to the creative stuff because I think when I get in business circles, I, I get referred to as the creative outside of the box thinker, et cetera, et cetera. And you can't even be pigeonholed in that. But, you know, I think that the one thing we're not talking about or we haven't mentioned yet, I think we're all talking about it, is courage. It takes courage to do things outside of the box because there's money involved and there's risk involved. And whether you're a food and beverage director at a boutique hotel or you're an independent opening your own venue, there's a, either your job's at risk or your livelihood's at risk in, in one way or the other. And most people in the independent you know, world versus the corporate world have never had to put themselves out or an idea out into a public forum. So everybody wants to write a book, make a movie and open a bar in their life, right? But when you make a movie, which I've made movies before, and when you put them out in the public eye, you can't explain to people what your budget was. You just get critiqued on the quality of what you made. Same with a restaurant. So it takes a lot for someone to say, I have a unique concept. There's an example that's not called Jake's Tavern. It's called Bodacious Lullaby or some cool name, right? They're, they're afraid. They're afraid to come out and do something different because they're going to be criticized, especially with the army of Yelpers. So... You know, I just think it's it, just to acknowledge it. It takes a lot of takes a lot of sand, takes a lot of courage to to go out and think outside of the box and then execute it. Yeah, because so uh, that kind of leads in. What were you going to say? Something? Well, I was just going to say. I was going to say, Michael. Like I, I, I agree with you. I, I painted and I was in the art world and stuff. And when you put yourself out on a painting, like you're putting yourself out there, and you're trans, you're so transparent, and. And a lot of people don't, I think, really understand that. It may look simple and may look easy, but even from like the stuff that we've all done on social, it's our we're, we're being more transparent than most people in the world, and and that comes as yeah, okay, that's great. Look at us, uh, and and people think it may be a self, you know, whatever, uh, like self. I can't think of the word. Say it's a long day, but um, it's scary, and it, and it, and you nailed it with courage. Um, because a lot of people I don't know necessarily look at as courage as maybe, Hey, the crazy ones, right? Right. The crazy. Ones. Right. Yeah. 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 Well said. So, um, so question two, it kind of segues from my, what Michael said about courage. Um, question two, how important is mindset when it comes to adapting to change? So obviously courage is part of that. What, um, let's start with you, Jay. Um, what kind of, how important is mindset when it comes to adapting to change? Huge, huge. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I'm going to say I come up against this every day is, is the environment that I work in is where I have to, I have to get other people to get in that same mindset um, because we tend to go to where our comfort zones are, right? Like we want to go here and, um, you know, even talking with some people, yesterday is trying to get them outside of their comfort zones and what they were working on. It's a challenge. So I, I would say mindset is crazy, not only for yourself, but the people that you're working with is to get them on the same page and just get them to start thinking like yourself. Uh, not easy. I know it is. We might, we might make it look easy, but it's not. Uh, but mindset is, is critical. Um, and I, and I, I would say don't use the word mindset cheaply in a mm -hmm. sense. I've heard it so much abused. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think we, we need to understand that mindset is, it may seem easy to say that, but it is very difficult to get everyone on your, behind you and following you. Yeah. 
Scott, what do you think? How important is mindset? Um, I uh, very controversial. I'm not sure how much mindset has to play in it because I think the people who are truly great at disrupting, the people who are truly great at making change, create things that are fundamentally innovative, I think already have the the skills of agility or the skills of being able to pivot and do all those things that change brings with it. I think what is a really valuable skill necessarily is around mindset of you or the disruptor. I think it's the way that's great. I've just texted a guy, sorry, uh, I was looking like an umpa lumper on screens. The lumps were really dim, so I just text someone to do it. So I'm glad I now don't look like an umpa lumper anymore. Um, it's taken him 15 minutes to work it out. Sorry, it's tough. What what I think is um, you need to be you need to be much better at inspiring and being a leader than having the mindset to be able to change because I think you're already there, especially if you're a disruptor. I think this is where leadership comes in because you have to be able to inspire. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to spin your ideas. You have to be able to take teams with you because you cannot make change on your own. You need people with you. And you've got to get them into the right the right headspace and you've got to get them believing. And I think that's a much different skill than kind of your own mindset. So I think it's more about inspiring, leading and motivating and being able to really sell what you're about to do and what you're about to change uh, to get people on the bus with you. So what you're saying is kind of like it's not necessarily having to change mindsets as a disruptor, but as you're laying that out, you've got to get the rest of your team to kind of shift from the status quo into why you're doing what you're doing now, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I truly, I truly believe if you're if you're a if you're a disruptor, you're an innovator. If you've got a team of people who can't change and can't be agile and can't pivot, you need to change your team because. You're just not the chemistry just isn't going to work. You have to people who can who, are, who embrace it. And I think, you know, I worked at hotels for 15 years. The reason I left was because we were doing the same thing all the time. We went into independent restaurants. And one of my skills, for whatever reason, was that I wasn't like normal hotel people. I embraced change. I love startups, I love new openings. And that whole mentality meant that I could go into environments and I could pivot and I could be agile and I could change. We were working with startups, we were helping them scale, all those issues that came with it, egos, challenges, et cetera. Uh, and what, what I found is there was people in the organization that couldn't keep up with the pace or couldn't adapt to things changing in an instant and needed manuals and things like that. It, it just didn't fit. I worked with a guy, a front office manager, um, worked for Four Seasons all his career, stayed from Four Seasons, came to work in our organization, which was much more entrepreneurial. It was much more about making decisions and, and not going by the book. And after two years, he was like, I just, I can't do it. It's just, there's no structure. It's just not there. And I think you've got to have the right people in the business who can with you because it's, it's, it's a skill. It's a skill yeah. to be able to do that, sure. I believe. So, Christian, you you own like seventy two companies. So, um, how do you take your your team through the process <laughs> of changing mindset every time you you know start a new company and shift gears? How do you take your team from the vision you have into um, changing the mindset and shifting gears with your people as you move back and forth between your companies? That's a really good question. So we have uh, uh, three simple principles. So our three principles are number one, our past doesn't equal our future. And so if and this is one of the things we live into on a daily basis, because just because it didn't work yesterday, doesn't mean it doesn't work today is number one. The second thing we practice is not knowing what we want to do. We need to do what we know. And what I I mean by that is because if we get really good in what we want to do, being a disruptor, being comfortable around that, it's really easy because I speak from who I am and what I know. And I think there's a challenge with that in our industry. A lot of people give advice around something they read that never actually did. And the reason I think this first round was so powerful because every single one, who, the answer they gave is because they lived into it. You know, it's really important for me. And the final thing for us is, is perseverance because I honestly believe the road to success and the road to failure are the same road. And if you do something, you're good at it, what you do, 
and you keep perse persevering, um, the only reason that road reads to failure is because I didn't listen to the right people. I didn't know what I'm really good at. And I didn't pivot as we often need to. I honestly believe same road. If you stay in the road long enough, you will succeed. It might not be six months. It might be six years. And what we find with the clients we work with and the people I work with, sometimes they that close to be on the road to success and not to Ooh. failure. So for me, the three things is really simple. Past doesn't equal our future. Let's not just do what we know. You know, we, we want to get really specific at it and be good at it. And the final thing is, let's find a way to persevere. So if something doesn't work, let's pivot. Let's try something new. We do it again. If it doesn't work, we, let's pivot. Let's listen to our customer and listen what the market tells us and pivot around that. So that's for me how we do it. Yeah, that's great. Michael, you've got you, you you've done a lot of things, you know, acting. You I know you were part of Bar Rescue and and other companies and owning restaurants. How do you kind of um, use mindset either for yourself or your team as you're shifting from one thing to the next? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my past is so funny. Like when I was a kid, I was an actor and then I got into being filmmaking, but the whole time I was in, in the F and B world in New York and LA and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, over, over time with the companies that I've, I've like, as an example, you mentioned that I own spots in LA and Florida. I just recently got out of all of them because I'm so focused on the new company I'm building. Cause I think it's, I've been one of those guys that's always had a hundred irons in the fire. And I'm starting to see now that you can do that. And just because you're capable of doing that, my mindset is, well, yeah, I can, but I want to craft something. And to do that, I have to be kind of obsessed with it. Like you would, if you were a painter on a piece. And I realized that I've definitely like, push my energy in different directions. <clears throat> so it's been good to focus on one thing. And ironically, one of the things that I'm working on with Monty is an element of mindset coaching with this new company. And why would that be different than any other company? So without plugging it, I think here's the key with mindset that you guys all touched on, but I think I'm taking it a step prior. Mm -hmm. Is what's the intention? Like Scott talked about it before. He said, well, you know, some guys who are natural disruptors have a built-in skill set or they've been doing these things for a long time. But a lot of guys who have that built-in skill set aren't innovators mm. because their intention is not to, like Steve Jobs didn't want to build the best computer in the world. He wanted to change the fucking universe. And the, and the, and the, and the, and the user was the motivation, not building the best computer. Right. So how can I create an experience for somebody using a device as an extension of themselves? That was the intention. And then this great thing happened with these great team of engineers. And he wasn't one of them. He was the visionary behind it. So you know, I think when we look at mindset, we have to find to intention as an example, making it specific about, let's call it an average bar restaurant in America, right? I can't, I can't speak for, for London, England. I'll leave that to Scott. But, <laughs> but being, a, being in a, and I love London. So being an American guy, I, I think that when I talk to my, our clients, I ask them, what's your intention? And most of them don't know. Because if you say, is your intention to make money? They'll go, well, yeah, yeah, of course. But it's, but it's also this. I'm like, yeah, because it's a sexy business. It's like investing in a movie. Is it really about making money and, and creating a service and serving others? That's one altruistic way of looking at it. Or is it simply a public form of recognition that you want as being the mm -hmm. cool guy? And what typically happens is there's a even before you even get started down that path of the venture, it becomes let's be really clear about what your intentions are, because that'll be really clear about who your partners are. It'll be really clear about who your consultants are. And then you're not going to end up eight months in going, how did I get here? Because once you open, you're on a public forum to fail. Absolutely, Dean. That's a great comment. Start with why in the fuck am I doing this? Why am I going to take out? I mean, think about it. I talk about this when I when I go on stage too, and you guys know this. Are we allowed to curse on LinkedIn? Yeah. We will find out. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Kids on LinkedIn, so, okay. I wrote I wrote dumbass on a um, in a group on Facebook and they wouldn't let me post it and I wasn't even calling anyone a dumbass I was just using that term you know like I, I can't be a dumbass right? right and and they wouldn't accept it because I had the word ass in it but LinkedIn yeah. is live man they can't they can maybe uh, shut it down but, they, <laughs> but it's live right now you're the, you're, the, you're the Andrew Dice play of consultants so. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, when we start looking at, you know, the industry as a whole, 
can we get into intention and mindset? I think the the why is, you know, like like Dean just commented, is is very, very smart. And I think that it's a, there's a reason why so many people are failing at it. So I always say this. I always use the dentist's office as an example, comparing it to hospitality. We all go to the dentist. We all brush our teeth. But because we brush our teeth and use floss and mouthwash, God willing, we all do, then that doesn't mean that we're going to go open a dentist's office. But in bars and restaurants, people go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I go to bars and restaurants all the time. I should own one. Like, it makes no sense at all on an entrepreneurial level. <laughs> so I think if people come to terms with that and they're able to look in the mirror and go, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm entering this from completely from the most part an egotistical curiosity. Then at least you can be honest because all progress starts with the truth. So even if that's the truth, that's okay. You can move forward from that and build a successful business. But you got to be real about it. Sticking feathers up your butt doesn't make you a chicken. So just, just because you say you want to open a bar and restaurant because you go to them doesn't mean you're going to open oh, one and be successful at it. <laughs> say, so for those of you meeting Michael for the first time, now you know why I like him so much. He talks, <laughs> he talks a straight game. There's no BS. I love it. I, I, um, you're a sweet man, you young whippersnapper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the old guy in the group. Hey, um, so since you um, – alluded to it. Let's go ahead and start with you and then we'll go to Christian and the rest of the group after that. So how are you disrupting the industry now? You thought you asking me? Yeah. Let's talk about your new project. Okay. So I'll be announcing the new company and introducing it publicly at Bar and Restaurant uh, on Monday, the 18th at around 3 or 4 p.m. I'm doing a, a workshop on guest experience. Uh, I'm really excited to have Monty as a piece of it. It's a new company called Maverick Theory, and it is a hospitality-based consulting firm with the kind of hidden power of a talent agency. We're starting with 27 consultants, and they are all highly skilled, highly respected within the industry. They're not people who have been around the industry for a long time. Uh, everyone from Michelin-rated chefs to Michelin-rated cocktail program people, um, professional bartenders, as pros like to be called, not mixologists. Um, you know, uh, to general managers, to director of ops from, you know, $100 million companies. But most importantly, they're all really wonderful people. They're salt to the other people who really understand how to talk to people. They understand the consulting game. And we're going to be getting into what makes it unlike any sort of conventional consulting maybe ever. So the goal of the company is to save the industry. And in a lot of ways, we've, we all know it's falling apart in its own right, hence that model. And the goal of the industry or the goal of the company is to introduce the 5% to the other 95% of the world of hospitality. So it starts with a very handshake level and hopefully we'll grow into something much larger. But I'm very excited about it, surrounded by brilliant people so who are teaching me a lot. So it's a very, very good thing. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, and you kind of shared with me um, kind of why you want it to be more like a talent agency. Are you? Can you talk about that now? Or are you saving that for? No, no, no. Yeah, I just feel like you guys kind of alluded to this before. I think you mentioned it, Christian, is that, you know, a lot of consultants in the business, it, a lot of them are brilliant. They're individual loan sharks who are out there on their own being consultants mm -hmm. and they really know their shit. And a lot of them yeah. don't know anything about the industry. Yeah. And you'll see, like, when I think of when I think of consultants, I think of pilots. Right. So I think when I'm going to hire a pilot to fly my family around, I don't care if they're a self-proclaimed expert. I don't care if they've been around aviation for years. I care about how many hours they have in a cockpit, what aircraft they've flown and what situations they've navigated through in tough situations before they fly my family around. I prefer an ex-military F-16 pilot. Right. But we're different. Our standards are different with hospitality consultants. You, you'll accept that they'll have a website that says been in the business for 30 years. Well, you should have a lot to show for it. If you've been in the business for 30 years mm -hmm. and have you been in the position of a GM who's been worried about losing his job for a year because budgets are changing? Have you been in that spot? Do you know what it's like to be a sous chef? Do you know what it's like to be an executive chef? Do you know what it's like to be a line cook? Do you know what it's like to be a host, a maitre d'? Like most of them don't. So it's important to consult from that point of view. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to take the parts that work of a talent agency like a CAA and take the... 20% of a talent agency that actually works and say, what if we could create a siphon filter of hospitality minds in the building of the company, but bring in the best of the best, the top gun instructors of the food and beverage world 
who actually have the real track records, who are not just on TV. Yes, we have TV people. I'm one of the assholes who was on TV. But I mean, if they were on TV, they're there because they're truly credible, not because they're glamour, glamorized in reality shows. So it was, what if, what if we changed price structure? What if we did a thing that broke the convention of selling packages to people and we everyone could say, hey, I can afford a Scott Turner because I know I can pay his daily rate for three days. And he comes out and I can have him help me with whatever I need in three days versus consultants selling these. We're going to do these packages. So it sounds like I'm pitching it's because I am. But that's essentially what, what the model changes is the way that we offer people services so we can actually help them. And a lot of people don't have the budgets to be able to bring in the world's best people for $20,000 for a week. They just can't. They're not a corporation. So do I want to bring a Michelin rated chef in to coach? my line cook from Pocatello, Idaho, if I, if that was a reality, I would absolutely do it if I could afford it. So we priced everything where people can afford it. So now they can get coached by the best people in the business, which I don't think from my research in the last 20 years has never existed. Because if I went to you, Scott, and said, hey, how's your food and beverage program at X hotel? And you said, well, look, it's great. But the truth is we have some mentoring issues, some staffing issues. But for the most part, we have a sous chef. It's really a problem. And the executive can't reach to him. And I'd say, OK, cool. That's what one of our Michelin guys who's an amazing sous, coach your sous. And that way you can invest in your staff. You know, um, so that's one element of what we're doing. But it, it ties into a lot of other stuff as well. So I, can't, I don't want to talk about too much of it. But I'm excited to, to send it to you guys and get your feedback on it. Awesome. Uh, Christian. By the way, Michael, that was awesome. Uh, I want to learn more about that. That's Ooh. pretty amazing. Thanks. You're um, very, very, very sweet, Christian. Thanks for letting me listen to my mouth for 20 minutes. Thank you. Now that's awesome. Um, <laughs> Did you see that Michael can say sweet multiple times during a show and then say the F word multiple times in a show? That's awesome. All right. Spoken <laughs> like a real chef. Um, so for us, this we, we take a, um, a different approach. So our, um, our rule or the way we want to disrupt the industry is different. So we want to help individuals and businesses merge their passion with their culinary endeavor. So what does this mean? So for us is um, I use COVID as an example. So COVID really did havoc on our industry. And being a lifelong chef, I seen the struggle or the stress he put on chefs because it's a very fragile industry. And what we learned through that is that chefs have transferable skills. So we want to highlight those transferable skills and teach them that they can do more than just food. And our goal is that we becoming the Netflix of culinary mindset education to give them the tools, the tips and the tricks they need to be successful in moving forward. And in our show, we bring some new uh, disciplines into the culinary world, which kind of intertwine, therefore, our disruptive mindset, the way we have those conversations, because I honestly believe a chef needs to be really clear on what they're good at. And then they build on that. And on top of that, they need to overlay what are the passions, what they really want to do. And I want to take the fear away from chefs that they say, this is the only thing I know how to do. And if I don't do this, I can't put food on the table. And that's not true. That's cool. And we, we're doing this a few different ways. So we developed this program where, for me, I believe having a book is the single best way to become a subject matter expert overnight. So we're teaching chefs how to write a book in eight weeks or less. And wow. one of our students wrote four books in eight weeks, you know, made multiple six figures in the process. And we kind of boiled it down really simple that you can do that. We also want to teach them some of the other aspects of the industry. I I found being 30 years in the industry, Michael, you know, that 90% of the restaurants fail not just because the chefs have amazing food. They never thought what thought the things which go with it. And, you know, being a, a good manager, being a, a good accountant, you know, being a good coach, being a, a good HR person, all the things which goes with it, they were never taught. And that's honestly believe why restaurants fail. So for us, the way we want to disrupt the industry is we want to have the chefs don't think differently of their career and how they can make an impact and hopefully have a purpose driven bay day in the process. I'm excited to talk to you more about that. That's really cool. Thank you. That's really cool. All right. Thanks, Christian. Uh, Jay, so uh, you're up there in Canada. We had a conversation the other day with, last night. It was freaking cold up there and it was 72 degrees it's not that and, cold it's not that cold yeah 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 I, <laughs> michael i'm trying to get him to move to florida 
Um, spoken, spoken like a true Canadian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> he goes ice fishing, I'm sure. Um, so, Jay, let's talk about, so you are Canada's restaurant guy. What does that mean? How are you disrupting the industry? Um, I'm going to brag on you in case you don't say it. You actually run, you have three of the top 10 podcasts in Canada on the restaurant industry. So I know you're putting a lot of content out there. How are you disrupting our industry with that? Yeah, um, I, <clears throat> we also launched the first late night show as well for our industry. So we, we do a late night show every day. Uh, across North America. So that's a lot of fun. And we use AI integration into it as well. So it's it's even a little bit more unknown as well in the late nights uh, spectrum, but uh, really disruption. So I'll kind of share what I've done <laughs> is that, um, so I'm in the food, food service space. I work for the largest food service distributor in the world. And I built uh, the first media network for our industry. And we had about 27 different shows on our network. Um, I'm Hopefully we'll be continuing this in a different venture, but uh, what it is is really bringing the food service space to more of a, a Netflix model where they can, you know, join shows, different, um, different shows, different cooking shows from demo shows to leadership shows and everything else through a media network model uh, that really hasn't been done too much before uh, in our space. So that's how I've been disrupting it and then just building content through shows uh, galore with people, um, really getting back into the whole media, those space of, uh, for our industry. So it's uh, been a big disruption as our industry tends to be very conservative, <laughs> I say that lightly, um, but very, uh, you know, simplistic, you know, they all believe food shows still, still work. And I believe that maybe we need to look at, you know, where our most chefs and restaurants live on their phones and how do we get to building a media network? So that's what I've been kind of disrupting is really uh, introducing a whole new way of looking at, the food service space across North America. Yeah. And if you uh, haven't checked out the show, Scott and I have been on uh, multiple shows of his. Um, and what I love about what Jay is doing is, you know, 20, 30 years ago, all us restaurant people were trying to get on, you know, we were trying to get on a show, right? We wanted our restaurant to be represented on NBC or, you know, Food Channel or something, right? We wanted that way of kind of telling our story and, and drawing people in to the human story of the industry. And, and I think that social media is going to eventually take over and you're not, it's already doing things. You know, when you look at Netflix and Amazon Prime and those things that are out there competing with norm, regular television, you're now seeing shows like this and, um, you know, podcasts that Jay's doing and other things, uh, Disruptive Chef that Christian does, and how that is um, disrupting the normal way we communicate. And now everyone, you know, we all, a bunch of us have friends, are friends with Sean Walchuk, and he says, you know, do some storytelling, pick up your phone, mm -hmm. just start recording uh, and making a difference. And Jay, you definitely are one of the ones really driving the bus when it comes to creating video content to the masses at a very um, digestible pace where we can absorb that information quickly in our crazy hurried schedules. So great job. Yeah, I have a, I have a motto. Every restaurant needs a podcast. Right, yeah. Scott, is there a plug for tomorrow? Uh, we're doing a show tomorrow. On this. We are, we're actually launching the first restaurant podcast in Canada in two weeks up here. Um, which will be a first for our Canadian market for a restaurant to have a, a weekly show out of their restaurant. So that's, uh, that's amazing. Yeah. So Jay, by the way, I, I'm a big fan of what you do. I love the late, the late night thing. I think yeah, between, you got to come on. All of you do. Yeah. I think Christian, Christian my, here's what's great. You can bring a cocktail with you to a late night show and drink <laughs> your cocktail while you're on the show. So I think we need to get Michael with his potty mouth, you yes. know, and us. We could, be the, yeah. we could be the Howard Stern of the food industry. 
I know it's so fun. You know, that, you know, it's funny you say that, Kristen. I was actually watching Howard last night. Going, I love the fact that Howard, and and that to me, the industry's personal. Like I have a personal. Like my my grandpa was a rum runner with El Capone, and it goes all the way back. And that's how I used to start my shows, uh, just oh, cool. as a relationship to uh, what what the industry means to me. But the industry really saved me in a sense of living in a very uh, I guess, I, I don't know how you say a, a house that was just a, not a very fun place to be raised in, but going to a restaurant every evening or with my parents on the weekends, that was my safe house, right? You, you know, sleeping in the booth as a kid and they wouldn't fight in a restaurant. So I have dedicated my whole life in my career, 34 years in this industry now of giving back and making sure our industry thrives, but also has a platform to tell their stories. So we, we do that on everything that I do is about the industry and about how we support it. Just like Howard does for is the music industry, mm -hmm. but it is really around, I want to make everyone in the industry, the rock stars of the industry, no matter if you're like a Monty or you're like um, a, a, a high, you know, a executive chef, everything and everyone we want to do that for. And I think every restaurant has a million stories to tell, as we all know. Um, and that could be a restaurant to a burger, a burger, uh, truck. Yeah. So, um, but that's my goal. And our late, my late night show is doing really well in a sense of the freedom that we give it. And we want to, we want to continue that because there's something special, uh, I think around just talking and having a great time because we, we all are, we love that part of the industry is having fun too. Right. But, uh, I will be sending you guys all an invite to join us on yeah, our late yeah. night show. Yeah, we just had. Uh, I have to say this because I was telling Monty about this. The lady that we had on not last night, the night before, uh, she was about to crack a bottle of whiskey, and I said, "Well, what's so special about this?" And she said, "Bob Dylan just gave it to me." So we're like, "What? <laughs> Don't crack it. <laughs> Let's have that in 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 person." So that's the that's crazy awesome. shit that happens on our show every night. That's amazing. Awesome. Scott, um, you're disrupting Europe and the hotel industry and all, and, and you're crossing out of Europe as well. Can you kind of share how you're disrupting everything? Yeah, listen, I'm going to tell my story a way I've never told it before because we're talking about disruption today, right? So for 23 years, I didn't give a shit, honestly. I <laughs> wanted to be the it. best. I love it. I wanted, to be, I wanted to be the best. I wanted to do the best. I wanted to work with the best and i didn't give a shit how i got there it was just a, there was something in me that was like i am gonna get there and i worked fucking hard uh, every day selfishly i've got a wife who's amazing and never gives me any shit when i don't come home because i'm at work and i was on a mission i was on a mission and it got to a point after 23 years where I'd worked with people like Alan Decast, I'd opened hotels with the Dorchester collection I'd been at collection I'd done projects in 12, 13 different countries. I'd managed restaurants. I'd managed hotels. And it got to a point where I was like, okay, now I'm going to change. Now I'm going to be the best and I'm going to do the best and I'm going to implement the best by helping other people think differently to be the best, do the best, at, uh, and implement being the best. So I left my role as CEO of a, of a Saudi investment business, nice salary, uh, nice cush office in the middle of Mayfair in London, members club opposite where I used to go and get a bollock in whenever I used to speak out in the boardroom and things like that. And uh, I set up my own business, Auden Hospitality. And I used 15 years experience in hotels, working in Dorchester Collection, Intercontinental, Gulf Resorts, City Centre hotels. And I understand how to do the boring shit like breakfast and room service and meeting and events and all of that stuff. And I, my seven years of working in independent restaurants, which is where I really learned how to run a hospitality business because of all the things we've talked about on this call. And I go back into hotels and I go, we have to do breakfast, but we're not going to do it the boring way anymore. We have to do meeting and events, but we're not going to do it the boring way anymore. We're not, we have to do coffee in a lounge, but we're not going to do it like an all-day dining lounge anymore. And we're certainly not going to call it a palm court lounge anymore. And we're going to think differently. We're going to do some fucking great shit together and make F&B in hotels somewhere where people want to go and spend time and want to be proud to work before again. Because not so long ago, the best chefs in the world 
wanted to be in the best hotels in the world. Now they don't want to go anywhere near them because they want to be on the high street. And it's time to change that. And it's time to think yeah. differently. And it's time to inject some different perspectives into hotels. And I'm working with hoteliers every single day to do it. Um, and it's fun. And I love making F and B different for people. I love them in different perspectives. I love pushing people out of their comfort zones. And I love stepping away from projects or clients and leading them in a better place. Not because of me, not because of my mission, not because of uh, where I want to be, because I've done okay with that. And uh, now it's other people. And it's getting other people to think differently. And I've never told that story that way anymore. But fucking hell, I'm going to go back and read it because uh, I think it's safe often. Yeah, that's great. Um, Michael, it's fine you... by Michael, so I dropped a few F-bombs in there for him as well. So. Was, that's fine. Hey. You, make, you make the word fuck sound so elegant, though. <laughs> that is just so wrong. Yeah, that is so wrong. I, um, here's, here's where Scott's I'm got British. all of it. That's just it. Not only it's a double threat because if the British accent, he could have worn a fucking tank top and sounded cool with coolness. But instead, he wore a suit and he's got the accent. Okay, he's got both of them, so we're all screwed. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, it's funny. It's funny if you're on Jay's late night show, um, you do get to let your hair down for those of us that actually have hair, um, and have a cocktail, you know, and and. Uh, and really be able to like uh, I think that my language changes a little bit when I'm on the late night show. You have drunk, Monty. You're half cut by the time no, we're finished. No, no, no. <laughs> it's one drink, dude. I'm totally sober. Um, Michael, did you still have a question for Scott? I know that you uh, were kind of asking about yeah. uh, the hospitality, you know, how hotels are super elevated in certain areas of hospitality and and what is he doing? You know, how exactly is he um, bringing restaurant stuff into the hotel? Did you want to? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, Scott, like I, I researched your company as an Auden Hospitality uh, prior to this, and it's it's one of the few consulting sites that I saw that I was really impressed with. Um, I think it's very well curated. It's incredibly simple, very clear. Um, the work itself speaks for itself, which is refreshing. Uh, it's also going to be judged on that curve, right? Like it, it might be, I could see it being really informative and kind of mind bending for a lot of people who aren't in the hospitality world. So my question would be, is I come from a similar background. You, you far, you went far more extensive in hotels than I did, but I got my start at the Tribeca Grand in New York when it opened in 2000 and that was the Soho Grand in 96. Those are the two boutique hotels in New York that really like changed the way New York City ran because there was no W yet. There was none of that stuff. And there wasn't like the the cookie cutter version of boutique hotels yet. Like Soho Grand was the one who gave away a goldfish for your room. They were pet friendly. Um, they're the first time that there was a limelight in the tunnel in New York City. And that's where everybody went. All the Wall Street brats, everybody went there to do drugs and celebrate and typical 90s crap. But then they stopped and they went to the Soho Grand and they were like, oh, well, instead of doing drugs in a stall with a bunch of kids, we can do them with a celebrity here. Great. Let's do that and, and leave and not get a room. And it, changed, it killed the nightclub in New York City in the 90s. So I got my start in that world in Grand Life Hotels. I got a start under their CEO and their food and beverage director. And I learned a lot in my early 20s, stuff that I had no business learning that they just took me under the thing. And I learned a lot about hotels and about business and from the food and beverage point of view. So to give you that background, my question was, Monty, I don't know if Monty misquoted you or not, or he had said, you have a saying that very much is like, let's try to bring restaurant culture into hotels, right? Versus yeah. the other way. Around. Yeah. So can you, can you expand on that? Because I'm, I'm curious to hear your thought process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the so the saying I always use is, uh, I have an edu a hotels, a hotel education and a restaurateur's mindset. Okay. Uh, so when, when I go back in and speak to I'll tell people it's like I get the breakfast and I get the meat vent, get it, it affects things that go on in kitchens and the way they do menus and things. But when you go in with a restaurateur's mindset, what you have with restaurants is you don't compromise, you're super agile. And I always tell a story about the first time I got a PL for a restaurant, I had uh, rent, utilities, and rate, business rates on there. And it was like, fucking hell, restaurant people have to make a lot more money to survive than hotels do and the door have rooms upstairs, and the door have the meeting events that bring in big room hires and things like that. 
So when you go back into a into a hotel now, the place where I am now, we're, we're doing a, a cafe concept here, an Aussie cafe concept, and we we have looked at that concept and looked at all the little details that make up a total experience that often hotels do all the same way. So, to, you know, they always do coffee, right, in hotels. It's always shit, generally, yeah? If you went into an independent restaurant, coffee would not be shit because they put their heart and soul into it because every coffee they sell keeps a roof above their heads and keeps the door open. In hotels, a lot of the time, those little details that go in there and and thought about so they put loads of you know they put I, I was talking about hotel in Kuala Lumpur a boutique hotel I won't say what it was but it was high end and uh, in my bedroom I had every single amenity in the bathroom you think from a comb through to uh, through to moisturizers through to everything you can think of but I went down for breakfast the first day and they'd done the milk uh, they'd done the coffee, sorry, and you could see where it had been done on a machine because it had the two things of coffee and the milk. And you're like, yeah. I can go to my room and I can get every amenity known to man, and I've just got the shit coffee for breakfast. And it's my first impression of your food and beverage outlets mm -hmm. is the coffee. I yeah. would be anal about that coffee, and a restaurateur would be anal about that coffee. And then when you're going into everything and you start looking at the quality and detail, like we've had a conversation today with a chef about fries. Like we have gone in on fries today on which are the best fries to you. The chef's like, yeah, but we can't do skin on because we don't do skin on everywhere. And I'm like, who gives a fuck? Like, who cares? Like, you've got a, a, a walk-in freezer the size of my house. Like, buy the chips. Like, it's about quality. And I think this is where sometimes, because there, there, there's a bit of tunnel, run, they get into this way where they start thinking about logistics and, back to your point, process. And it almost takes over quality, um, and and it's difficult for them. And then I think the other thing as well is, and it was certainly the case of, of what I was like in hotels. Hotel people have a really bad habit of staying in hotels. They don't go out of hotels. They hire from within hotels, so they never get an outside perspective. They unveil the hotels. They mates with people in hotels. We spend time in restaurants. Back to your point where you were saying, I always work with three restaurants on an ongoing basis because I don't want to lose that restaurateur mindset. And I go back in with them and I work with them with being creative. I work with them on the business side. I keep that agility. I keep that focus on how to be a restaurateur so that I don't fall into habit. And can keep bringing that agility, the way to disrupt the current trends, what we're seeing in the market back to hotels so that I can use that with them. Uh, I think people get into so much tunnel vision because it's easy to do, that they don't go looking at the uh, guys down the road uh, and looking at how they can compete with them. They're looking at the hotel down the road and looking at how they can compete with those guys. I'll guarantee if you're in a hotel today and you focus on the two or three guys that are independents down the street and not your guy up the road, you'll be more successful than him because he's going to be looking at you. And, and, and that's, the, that's the way it is. When we go in there, we look at it and we sit back. You know, we, 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 put, a, um, we put a podcast student to uh, some meeting and events. These meeting and events in this hotel, it was in a basement, no windows. Uh, they struggled to get them filled. We we're like, okay, so you've got this meeting room that never gets used. And it's in a basement with no windows. It's the perfect place to put a podcast studio. How many of your competitors have a podcast studio? Oh, why would we want one of them? Put one in. It's going to cost you about $500 and see what happens. You're going to be the guy in your competition that's got a podcast studio and start talking about it and start talking about it on social media. Hey, presto, three months fully booked and, and booked, still booking in now. And it's all because of that way of we're going in. And, and doing it and we talk to people like you we talk to people like talk to people like jay like monty and we're bringing different perspectives that pushes our knowledge base and back to that bit about when i was in hotel I give a shit i would never have jumped on a call with you guys because i was so tunnel visioned on my hotel and all the rest of it so it's that whole bit about expanding of mindset that expansion of mind that you can take that resource back and it's that's why i say now it's not about my mission and things like that. It's taking all those learnings, all that experience that I see outside 
and bring it back into hotels and go, you can do things really differently and self proud. Because exactly what you said, 5% of people are doing it right. That leaves 95% of opportunity. And you have a decision to make whether you're going to seize that opportunity or you're going to stay in the 95%. Well, look, that makes a lot of sense. I, I appreciate you breaking that down. And I'm going to steal all of it, by the way, Scott. So uh, <laughs> it's really good because I, I think if I'm hearing you correctly, and jump in if I'm off here, I, I what I hear is a lot of it has to do with product and creativity and function. Right? It's a lot of function and following the crowd at lunchtime and doing it the way it's supposed to be done. So I totally get that. That makes complete sense to me. That's very smart and very um, observant and intuitive. What I what I told Monty is I pitch the total opposite when it comes to hospitality, because restaurant tours, at least in the states, it's the it's the difference. It's a good Danny Meyer thing that he's he's built his career on. But it's it's well, we all know it. There's service and then there's hospitality, and people think they're the same thing and they're the total opposite, right? So one is the functional way of doing your job. And every step of the way of on any element of the business. And one is how people feel about it and how you make them feel, period. <laughs> right. So it's it, what I always tell them if you want to, if you want the ultimate cheat code, always run your restaurant as if 400 people are above you. And every guest that walks in your hotel is already, or your venue is already paying a thousand dollars for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when you do that, you really can't screw up because that's a standard. So I'm like, when someone walks up and they want a glass of water on a very busy night at the bar, you can't be like, dude, you got to order something, which is what restaurants do. They don't look at it and go, oh, that person's like a guest here. Like, it doesn't matter what they're ordering. And that typically shifts them into that six gear they didn't know they had. Right. Mm -hmm. So and most people are just ignorant to it. So there's a tie in that. But I just wanted to kind of end on this one thing. The one thing that you said that's so poignant is about like uh, the podcast booth, right? Or something you'd put into a space that's non-usable. I talk about this a lot and I, I'll try to shorten this for you guys. You don't, you know, you don't want to hang yourselves when you're talking for too long, but it's, it's this, it's our business model. If it didn't exist is actually the worst business idea ever created. So like, as an example, if there wasn't a thing called bars and restaurants that had been around since the time of Christ, right? If there wasn't that, and it was just simply, okay, I want to pitch you, Scott. I have this cool business idea. I need $1.5 million from you. I have a rectangle space. That's a retail, like a commercial space. I'm going to, I'm going to lease that and I'm going to sell alcohol and you're going to say, okay, well, is it special alcohol? I'm going to go, no, no, you can buy it at any store, Uh, but I'm just going to charge 10 times as much for it and go, okay, what about the music and the food? Well, the food will be specialized and there'll be one thing and the music will be cool. Well, could you have someone cook at your house for you? Could you play that music on Spotify? Yeah, yeah. There's nothing unique about it. Okay. And you're going to charge people three to four times as much for that. And they're just going to show up and give you their money. Sounds like a really good idea. A lot of good upside for the end user. Right. It's a terrible fucking idea for a business. What works about it is when people understand that it's a social experiment. It's the human condition. Nobody goes out to a bar or restaurant because they want to spend $7 on a PBR. They go out because they want to be alone together. It's part of the way we're built. It's we're tribal by nature. And when people realize that there's a box that everybody needs to get together, and that's the real ethos of why they go out, not because they're justifying a, a product choice like a new computer, then they start to figure out like what you said, which is brilliant. Utilize your space so you create experience. The food and beverage should be a catalyst to build relationships. Right. So restaurants get somewhat of a skew on that because obviously things can be chef driven or food driven. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, nobody wants to have a world class chef and eat by themselves. Typically. Mm-hmm. So, no, I, I applaud to how you look at hotels and how you how you break down space. I think that's very especially on a functional. Level. If, if you like what Michael just said and you're going to be in Vegas at Bar and Restaurant Expo next week, make sure you catch his session. He does one called. The Wizard Behind the Curtain, and it's one of the best sessions I saw last year at Bar and Restaurant Expo. And he basically breaks down what he just said, which which is talking about the experience, you know, and how important that is. Um, we uh, appreciate everyone being on the show. All of you appreciate all of the guests that um, have been watching online and those of you that will watch in the future. Um what I love about these situations and why I'm so excited to do the show every Thursday instead of just writing my um, call or my uh, newsletter is because none of us are as smart as all of us. And when we get a group of people together like this, 
or like the things that each person on, on this uh, show does, whether it's Michael curating uh, talent for your restaurant or Christian developing chefs to be able to write their own books and all the things he's involved in or working with Jay and being on a podcast and fixing ho hotels and, and, you know, odd and hospitality, whatever that looks like, bringing the five of us together uh, and sharing ideas. I always learn so much from these calls, number one. And number two, I really get excited about uh, connecting people. It's what I did in restaurants for, you know, my whole life, connecting people to other people. And, and um, I think that there's a lot of value in meeting on stage like this and then potentially growing that, you know, I met, I met Christian through Troy Hooper and, you know, I'm, I think I met Scott through Troy Hooper and, you know, um, I think Jay and I met through Matt Rolf, you know, and so um, being able to create this uh, massive seven degrees of separation um, is really going to benefit the industry first, but by benefiting each other, it also magnifies our voice, which then again helps the rest of our industry. So thank you gentlemen so much for coming on the show. Uh, please join us next week uh, and we'll see you soon. Cool. Thanks, Jen. It's great talking to you guys. Hey,